on. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Capehart with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to the webinar. The title of today's webinar is Urgent Housing Programs for APS Clients, and I will introduce our speakers here shortly. Uh, next slide. Quick disclaimer before we get started. The National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System, or NAMERS, and the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, are a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the federal government's point of view. I think I get quicker at reading that each and every time that I read it. So next slide. A quick note about our APS TARC. We're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us. We'll have some contact info uh, displayed at the end of the webinar if you don't already have that information. We work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. That basically just means you can reach out to us with any problems that you have. Um, we're here to help APS programs any way that we possibly can. So. Next slide. Please consider joining one of our peer-to-peer -peer calls. If, if you've never joined one before, uh, we have three calls per month. There's one for uh, geared for investigators, one uh, for supervisors, and then one for administrators. The schedule for these calls is on your screen. Um, you can check out our website or email us for more information, um, and you do have to register for each of these calls. We find these calls are extremely helpful for folks in the field, especially, um, you know, this year with all of the formula grant um, changes to programs, you can, uh, on the administrator's call, talk to your colleagues about what they're, what they're doing. So, uh, next slide. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. Today's slides are available to download in the handouts section of your GoToWebinar control panel. Just click on the icon that looks like a little piece of paper. All participants are muted for this webinar and you may use your computer or your phone to access audio. Just adjust the volume on your computer speakers to the desired level. If you have any audio problems or issues with connection during the webinar, what we recommend is exiting the webinar or, you know, exiting out of it completely and then coming back in. That fixes the situation almost always for folks. So if you have any issues, we suggest just getting out and then coming right back in would be the best way to try and fix those. Next slide. You can ask questions of our presenters today at any time by typing those questions in the questions box. I think it also says questions slash chat. Um, we'll relay as many of those as we can to the speakers when we pause for questions at the end of the event, but you don't need to wait. You can type your questions anytime you like as they occur to you and we'll get to them at the end. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and all registrants will receive an email when the recording is made available on the Huddle website which everyone should have access to. If you do not have access to Huddle, please talk to your grant coordinator or you can email the APS TARC and we'll get you in touch with um, whoever you need to to work that out. All attendees will receive an automatically generated email approximately 24 hours after the webinar ends and there'll be a link to a certificate of attendance just in case you need that. So next slide. So our speakers today, we have a, um, a great couple of speakers and myself. Um, I'm going to read a couple of bios for you. The first speaker is Joy Solomon Esquire. Joy is the director and managing attorney of the Weinberg Center. Joy co-founded the Weinberg Center in 2004. She was previously director of elder abuse services at the Pace Women's Justice Center and an assistant district attorney in Manhattan, where she served for eight years. Joy is a frequent speaker and writer on the issue of elder abuse and elder justice, including the United States Senate Special Committee on Aging. In addition to developing evidence-based screening protocols and long-term care, Weinberg Center Risk Abuse Prevention Screen, Joy co-authored and published two research papers relating to evidence-based screening for elder abuse. Joy's work in long-term care also includes an active role in the creation of sexual expression policies for residents, a resilience slash well-being program for caregivers, and a fresh look at death and dying in long-term care. Um, Joy is also a certified yoga instructor and teacher of breathing and, medication, and meditation. So that's an interesting fact. Our other speaker is Tristan Sullivan Wilson. Tristan is a staff attorney at the Weinberg Center. She is a 2018 graduate of Northeastern University School of Law, where she uh, concentrated in poverty law and economic justice. She was the executive articles editor for the Northeastern University Law Review and worked as a research assistant, focusing on public health law and legal history. 
Prior to joining the Weinberg Center, <clears throat> excuse me, she worked in local public health policy issues at Georgetown Women's Law and Public Policy Fellow in Washington, D.C. And then our final speaker, but actually I'll be going first, is myself. Um, I think many of you on the call already know me, but my background is as uh, uh, starting out as an APS worker many years ago and then moving up as a supervisor and manager of a program in Columbus, Ohio. I worked for the National Center on Elder Abuse for a year or so and was deputy director of the National Adult Protective Services Association for about seven years before coming to WRMA, where now I'm leading the technical assistance part of our program. So we have a good lineup for you today. Next slide. I'll start our presentation today and discuss temporary emergency housing options. As I said a bit ago, I started as an investigator in APS, and at that time, <clears throat> I was actually responsible for securing the various options for emergency housing for the department. So I have some experience in this area of uh, program development. I negotiated the contracts with several of our folks that we used for uh, temporary emergency housing, uh, monitored the, our use of, of those contracts and what have you. So um, that this is a, a important issue that I'm particularly interested in today. One thing to note is this presentation assumes your client needs immediate intervention and is willing to relocate temporarily, or that all the options have been exhausted if there's court intervention involved. So you've tried everything that's less restrictive that you possibly can, if there's some sort of court intervention, um, or that you have a client who is you know, willing to relocate. It does assume those two things. Next slide. So a little scenario that if you've worked uh, close to the front lines as a, an investigator, a supervisor, or maybe a little bit further up, um, this may not be too unusual for you to hear. I'll read this real quick. A call comes into your APS intake hotline on a Friday afternoon. An elderly woman was reported to the police by a neighbor as having been abandoned by her caregiver. The police are calling for help with the elderly woman who appears severely neglected. She is confused and unable to respond to direct questions with any information about her health needs. There is no known contact information for the caregiver or for other relatives. And this is actually a scenario that I dealt with um, as an investigator. I think it's likely that many investigators have handled similar situations like this. Uh, they're some of the most challenging cases one can deal with if they you know, really are an abandonment scenario. Uh, this is a good example of the sort of cases where APS may need to go after emergency housing of some kind. Next slide. <clears throat> so let's first define the need. Um, a few examples of situations where APS may need temporary emergency housing, um, maybe in cases of extreme self-neglect. Maybe the home is in disrepair and very dangerous to any inhabitants. I've seen uh, cases where you can actually look through the floor and see into the, the level below that, whether it's the basement or the first floor, ceilings are caving in, um, you know, major structural home damage. That could be one scenario. Maybe a client resides with a perpetrator. Um, if the perp is in the home and there are serious allegations of physical or sexual abuse, Temporary relocation may be needed depending on the circumstances that you're dealing with. And we'll talk about a few alternatives um, of this sort uh, in a situation like this shortly. And then eviction, I think all APS workers are familiar with probably with dealing with cases with eviction. At one point, the um, New York City Adult Protective Services Program told me that over 50% of their cases involved eviction in some way, shape or form. That's probably an extreme statistic, but um, you know there are programs out there, especially in, in urban areas, <clears throat> that deal with eviction on a regular basis. So that may be one reason why you need emergency housing. And then abandonment, when a caregiver has disappeared, just like in the scenario that we read a bit ago, and there's no other family or friends that can step in to help someone. Next slide. Some of the major challenges in establishing temporary emergency housing. Funding obviously is, is a challenge. I mean, up until this year, there's never been dedicated federal funding for adult protective services um, to cover such services as emergency housing. Um, but now that we have the formula grants, many states are using their funds to cover this sort of service uh, and local funding is often inadequate to establish something like this. Time is another challenge. Uh, most programs don't have staff time that's dedicated to securing these sorts of resources or making agreements with housing providers of different kinds. 
And then more importantly, the case may come to the attention of APS at a real critical moment when immediate intervention is needed. Housing or services may need to be secured within hours sometimes. Um, you know, if you get the call on Friday afternoon or Friday around four o'clock, you may have to set something up by seven or eight o'clock that evening. So options for emergency housing, your community may not have elder shelters, such as the one that uh, Joy and Tristan will present on today. Uh, there may be few or no facilities in your community, especially if you're in a rural areas um, or only one that can take emergency cases and maybe they'll be full. So um, options are always an issue. And then state regulations and requirements. I have a slide later on that um, goes over this sort of thing. Um, if you're using a facility, your state likely has requirement around medical history documentation and testing. You know, we'll just again discuss these a bit later. And if the client has not seen a physician in years, it can be really difficult to obtain the type of documentation that you need um, to get someone admitted to a facility that provides medical care. Next slide. Um, so temporary emergency housing and APS is not an easy task. I'm sure that most of you on the call, if not all of you know that already, uh, for some of the reasons that we've listed already. Careful consideration has to go to the care needs of the client um, and assessing these must often be done very, very quickly. Elder, elder shelters, which again, we'll hear more about in a bit. If you have one in your community, we recommend that be the first line of defense or the first option that you go to if you're fortunate enough to have one of those in your community. I think you'll understand why that's your go-to uh, in a minute when we hear from uh, Joy and Tristan. Consider what options you'll want to establish if you don't have an elder shelter in your community. And we'll discuss all of these options and some of the ins and outs of them, like homeless shelters, hotels, group homes, assisted livings, et cetera, on the following slides. Uh, next slide. A special note about alternatives to emergency housing. Um, as is the case with any APS case, uh, the least restrictive option should always be explored. Relocation is very restrictive, so consider what can be done in lieu of relocation if it's appropriate given the situation. Um, can you quickly establish home health services even if the need is for 24-7 supervision? This could be very costly, but if you price this option, you might find that it's similar or less than um, temporary relocation in a nursing facility. Uh, this assumes, of course, that the home is appropriate and safe for the home health staff to go into. If cleaning services are neater, needed, a homemaker, um, establishing a homemaker quickly in conjunction with other services can be very helpful. Um, you need to think about, will home-delivered meals or food pantry services meet the nutrition needs if you're going to put services in and keep the client in their home? And how quickly can you start those? If the client is, uh, for instance, on dialysis, can you quickly establish medical transportation for the client? Uh, well, you need a wheelchair lift option if you do establish that transportation. How quickly can you put an emergency response system in place if that um, you know, is appropriate for the client where you have the button they can push, they have the button they can push if there's some sort of emergency to get a response? Would the client be able to attend adult daycare, an adult daycare setting, and how quickly can you start this sort of service? Um, when combined with overnight home health, this you know, could be appropriate. And then many adult daycares, as I'm sure folks on the line know, uh, can provide personal care services, such as bathing during the day. And then if the client resides with a perpetrator and abuse is alleged, um, can a temporary restraining order be filed to remove them from the home? This may be the only option in a situation where the perpetrator has established residency or has lived in the home with the client for a long period of time where you, um, you're not able to get them out of the home because they've established residency and an actual proper eviction is what needs to take place. Next slide. Homeless shelters and domestic violence shelters uh, will be appropriate where the person doesn't have medical or behavioral health needs. Of course, clients without these needs, if you are in a state that requires disability or, vul or vulnerability to be eligible for APS, um, you know, you're not going to find a lot of, a lot of clients um, on anyone's caseload. They're going to be few and far between, um, you know, if that's part of your definition of eligibility. It's important to form a relationship with your local homeless or domestic violence shelter, um, have a dialogue with them and understand what kinds of cases they're capable of taking and what they're not capable of taking. Consider inviting them to your multidisciplinary team if you have one. 
some of the homeless shelters and DV shelters aren't accessible to people in a wheelchair or with other mobility issues. So that's important to keep in mind. And you should also keep in mind homeless shelters are fairly rough environments, for lack of a better phrase. I've seen clients victimized in homeless shelters um, and financially exploited. Um, your client may have to leave during the day if the shelter closes and only opens at night. You have to consider if this is appropriate. On the upside, um, housing counseling services are typically available and can be very beneficial um, for those who are appropriate to go to a homeless shelter. And we have some resources here listed. If you download the, um, the handout today, you'll be able to visit these links. Uh, we'll also post it with the recording of this webinar later on so you can explore these other resources from um, the National Center um, on Abuse and Later, National Clearinghouse on Abuse and Later Life and the National Coalition for the Homeless. Next slide. A little bit about hotels. Hotels may be more appropriate for clients with no or very minimal care needs who should not be referred to the shelter system um, if they're independent yet frail or at risk for victimization in some way. This can be a good option. Um, it's If you're going to set up an agreement with a hotel to place clients there, um, it can be beneficial to enter into an agreement with one or mo more hotels. Um, if they're going to need to bill you for the stay, this will be necessary because hotels require payment up front most times. Make sure the hotel has emergency contacts, such as an on-call worker or the name of the caseworker assigned to the case if there is a need to reach someone quickly. Hotels may provide some toiletries and possibly even meals if there's a restaurant on site, so factor that into your agreement if you're going to place clients there. Pick one or more hotels that are in good location in a safe location. Um, the most cost-effective hotels or motels may not necessarily be in good neighborhoods. And I know this because I worked with an agency that had a, an arrangement set up with a hotel that they would place clients at, and the client actually got mugged, um, was robbed outside of that hotel. So you want to make sure that you are you know, trying to um, place it in, in, a, in a neighborhood that's going to be safe for your client. And consider whether you need more than one hotel as an option. If you contract your hotel and they are full, what are you going to do? If, um, if you need to place someone, will you need a backup or more than one option and more than one location uh, where you practice APS? Next slide. Group homes, or what are sometimes called adult foster homes, are available in some areas, and assisted livings are similar options as well. Uh, these are settings that would be appropriate for someone with moderate care needs, such as personal care assistance, nutrition, or laundry services. Uh, you'll want to enter into a written agreement or you know, write a memorandum of understanding with the home or facility so that everyone understands the boundaries of the relationship. Document the billing procedures and the pricing. Uh, some may require a deposit, just like an apartment. If your program will institute time limits on how long the client can stay or how long your program can pay for the stay, then you'll want to document that in the agreement as well. Make sure emergency contacts and procedures for contacting um, them are lined up so you know how to get a hold of people when you need to. Include information about what medical documentation is needed up front. Um, and most importantly, whether in writing or not, make sure the facility or the, um, the group home understands the nature of your, of your needs and that relocation may need to take place very quickly. You may need to do that within a matter of hours and make sure that they, that they understand that. And before selecting a home or facility, make sure to check any Department of Health surveys or um, you know formal reviews. You're obviously will not uh, you'll obviously not want to retain any facility that has documented issues in the past. And then also make sure your client understands that the move is temporary. They may really enjoy the assisted living. They may come to like it quite a bit, and they would not want to leave. Um, you know, if they don't have the means to stay there, or if you don't have an assisted living waiver program in your state, and they're not going to be able to stay there, then you know it's important for them to know up front that it is a, uh, a temporary situation. So, next slide. If your client has many care needs, especially from a medical standpoint and in a nursing facility, maybe the most appropriate for a temporary stay. Um, you know, things like medication administration, wound care, or dementia are important considerations um, if you're going to place someone in a nursing facility temporarily. 
Uh, just as referenced before, you'll want to enter into an agreement so that everyone understands the billing, the pricing, what the time limits of the stay are or how long you will pay for that placement, uh, what the emergency contacts are, and then the facility understands the need for a very quick relocation, um, which can be challenging with nursing homes, and we'll talk about why here in a moment. Um, you'll, you may also want to check the medicare.gov site. They have a tool called Nursing Home Compare, and I've added a link to the slides in the handout. Um, you should consult this <clears throat> when you're looking at a facility, look at the history, look at the official surveys, and see what was documented in the past with any given facility. Next slide. So a special note about the documentation needed for nursing home or assisted living placements. Um, I believe these vary from state to state, but they're also possibly quite consistent from state to state. One thing you'll probably need to place someone in a nursing home is a history in physical that often involves uh, chest x-rays. So you'll have to think about whether the client's seen a physician recently, what will you do if they have not? Um, many APS clients have not seen a physician in years. Um, you'll have to think about whether that client has had a, a test for COVID or other communicable diseases that may be required before admission. And then does the facility require an interview or visit with the client prior to admission? Will they be able to do this quickly? <clears throat> and may they decline the admission ahead of time if you're going to place somebody on an emergency basis? And as I said earlier, clients who have not seen a physician in years are not uncommon in APS. You can consider securing an agreement with a very, you know, with a specific physician in your community or even with an urgent care facility. Um, you'll need to pay for the appointment, obviously, um, and, you know, ask if they can bill you for it. And check the physician or the urgent care's medical license to make sure that this is someone that's, you know, uh, and, and someone upstanding in your community. It's important to note that hospital emergency departments typically will not assist with the medical documentation needed to place someone into a nursing home. They're not equipped to do history and physicals for patients. And if you send someone to the emergency room, especially if there is no true medical emergency, they may decline to provide any of this documentation for you to actually place your client. Next slide. Some additional issues to consider. Does the client have pets? Many clients will not leave their home without the pet or knowing that the pet is safe and can be returned to them. Can you par partner with a local pet shelter or animal control on this issue to care for the pet while the person is in temporary housing? Um, consider how the client will be transported from their home to the setting. Will they need a, a wheelchair lift or will they need even possibly an ambulette service um, because they're, they're not even able to use a wheelchair? Uh, another agreement with a medical transportation provider may be necessary, just so you have all your ducks in a row in case they're needed. And then another note is to start planning for permanent solutions immediately. What will need to be done to return the client to their home and how long will it take? If new housing, permanent housing is needed, who will your partner, um, will you partner with a community organization to help facilitate this? Will your funding be able to cover the length of stay necessary to plan for a permanent solution? And then what are the contingency plans if you're using a setting that is very costly, such as a nursing facility, and plans fall through? What will you do for that client? Um, make sure the facility and the client understand that, again, that this stay is temporary. Uh, this is very important because the client may not be able to continue to reside in whatever setting that you use, um, although they also may be able to continue to reside there. I've seen that happen as well. So. Um, but it's important to, to make sure they understand that it's not a permanent setting, that it is temporary. Next slide. So again, the APS TARC is here to uh, help you with forming or revising any of your emergency housing plans. We can review your agreements, help you establish policies and procedures, or work with you on other issues. Here's a link to our contact information on our website. You can reach out to us at any time. And we'll be happy to help you because um, many states, as I said before, are um, putting in emergency housing or urgent housing plans with their formula grant funds. So we are here to help you in any way that we possibly can for that. Next slide. So now I'm happy to turn things over to Joy and Tristan to um, talk about the very impressive elder shelter system that they work with and the elder shelter shelter that they um, they run in uh, New York City. So uh, Tristan, Joy, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Um, 
And you can go to the next slide. So I, I want to start just by saying thank you so much to APS TARC for inviting the Weinberg Center, uh, Tristan and me, to uh, talk this afternoon about um, our, our model and um, really the partnership that we have with APS. Um, and I really wanted to thank each of you on the call for your work um, always, but in particular, um, certainly over the last year and a half, um, I've heard some really wonderful and heroic stories coming out of APS. Um, and um, we are really grateful for the work that you do. It's very hard work um, that you do. And, um, you know, we've seen it up close. And so I really, really do appreciate um, the work that you're doing. Um, I wanted to start our presentation, and you can move to the next slide, um, with this video. Um, this is a client um, that we had at the Weinberg Center, and I, um, I think videos can be, and the stories, individual stories are really helpful. Um, in talking a little bit about the work we do. And um, so if you can play this, uh, this, this will be a good lead off to some of the work that we do um, through the eyes of Carmen. All right, and this is Andy. I'm going to, give me one second, I'm having a little bit of trouble. I guess, well, um, Andy, do you, oh, am I muted? Oh, there we go.
Thanks. You can go to the next slide. Great. Um, so you can see a, a little bit about the work that we do um, and the critical nature of our relationship with community partners. Um, APS was one of our first and remains one of our most critical community partners. We partner with APS through our shared clients. Um, we sit with APS on several multidisciplinary teams, including several in New York City um, and the Westchester County multidisciplinary team, which is run um, by one of the lawyers at the Weinberg Center. We've done um, many trainings over the 17 years that we've been open with Adult Protective Service uh, and also trainings for um, new uh, Adult Protective Service workers. So it's both collaborative trainings and trainings for, and really most importantly, um, APS and the Weinberg Center, we see each other as a resource for each other um, where we want to support APS and their clients that need shelter and sometimes um, will need APS to do certain things in order to, um, as we talked about in the video, help that person reclaim their life and figure out what it is that they need. Uh, next slide. So Andy's going to launch the poll now, and the question is, do you and your clients have access in your community to appropriate shelter and housing solutions? All right, I've launched that, so our attendees can vote by clicking directly on their screen. Um, if you're in full screen mode, you may have to hit escape on your keyboard to go back to the regular view <clears throat> to vote if you're having any problems. Just a little pro tip keep that open for just a few more seconds. Lots of people have already voted, but we'll leave it open for another 10 more seconds or so to give everybody a chance to vote. And again, you click directly on your screen to respond to the question, do you or your clients have access to appropriate shelter and housing solutions? All right, I'm going to close that poll out and then share the results with everybody. It looks like 4% said yes, 25% or a quarter of folks said most of the time, 33% said rarely, and 38% said no. So the lion's share of our attendees today said no to answer this question. Yeah, I, I love these polls. This is like one of my favorite, my favorite thing about... Uh, uh, doing these uh, online trainings that you really get, you know, pretty quick feedback. So I really appreciate that. And I'm not surprised. I think if my math is right, it was like 71% um, have said that they rarely or do not have access to shelter. So hopefully um, you're going to, you know, we're going to be the beginning of change to that um, through this webinar. Next slide, please. So the elder abuse shelter model um, is uh, one solution, we think one important solution to the question of shelter. Um, it differs from some of the um, kind of urgent programs that, that Andy talked about earlier. Um, in most cases um, with the model that we're talking about, physical sheltering is only one part of the model. What it really is about um, is holistic victim center services from a shelter team, um, which includes often lawyers, social workers, and other professionals working with older adults, or um, community-based professionals who will address specific issues stemming from um, the abuse that the clients have experienced. So the elder abuse model um, is a program that's designed to address many things, um, including uh, the physical sheltering. Next slide, please. So these are three um, typical or, or kind of the different ways in which we see shelters um, in our models. And we're going to discuss this more later, but um, just to kind of prepare you, one is a shelter program affiliated with a single long-term care facility, and that's like the Weinberg Center, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. The second model is an external shelter program that coordinates placement 
at various housing sites. So that circle in the center um, is the a program and the, the others are different housing sites that they, they have MOUs with and other agreements. And the third model is some other combination of shelter solution and support. And I think Tristan's gonna talk about models two and three. Um, next slide, please. So this really um, is meant to show you and illustrate um, who the referrals are for us um, at the Weinberg Center. And I think this is pretty typical in a lot of communities who is affected um, by the issue of needing shelter. And you'll see it's a pretty broad swath of many um, parts of the community uh, who come in contact with older people um, who need shelter. So it includes local hospitals, uh, AAAs, senior centers and other nonprofits, DA's offices, legal service agencies, um, like civil legal service agencies, community-based as well as um, maybe run by the city, victim service agencies, home health agencies, financial institutions, um, MDTs, the court systems, and all forms of law enforcement um, are, have been referrals for us throughout the years. Next slide. So um, Andy again is gonna initiate this poll and the question is, is there an elder abuse shelter program in your community? Please. Thank you, Joy. Now I've launched that just like the other poll. You can vote by clicking directly on your screen. And again, if you're in full screen mode, you might have to hit escape to be able to vote. We'll leave this open for a bit, but the uh, answer is rolled in pretty quickly to this one. So maybe just another <laughs> 10 seconds or so. And yeah, very quickly. Mm, five more seconds and then we'll wrap it up. All right, I'm gonna close that poll out now and share the results. 83% unfortunately said no. 8% said not sure, and 8% said yes. So there is a, a small group of folks that do have an elder shelter in their community. I'm so excited to see that 8% yes. <laughs> um, so my name is Tristan Sullivan Wilson. I'm the staff attorney here at the Weinberg Center. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'm going to talk through a little bit the Spring Alliance. Um, that's a coalition of different people and organizations that are either currently running or initiating shelter programs in their community. So Spring Alliance Shelter Partners, Regional, National, Global. Um, the next slide, please. So this is a growing coalition of folks all over the country and Canada. <laughs> um, and this is a really great coalition of folks that have started or are thinking about starting shelter programs. And it's really a space where we can share resources, talk through problems, um, and also share best practices and lessons learned. All of these, I mean, I'm sure you can tell looking across this list, it really covers a lot of different communities across the country, but also different types of communities. We have urban settings, uh, suburban settings, and really rural settings. And what it looks like to have an elder abuse shelter in those different types of communities is really different, um, which is also why we have those sort of three buckets of types of elder abuse shelters. It really, there's no one specific way that you can run an elder abuse shelter. It really depends on the resources available in the community um, needs that, that you have. Um, next slide, please. Um, just really quickly, I think we can't do presentations this year without reflecting at least a little bit on the last year and uh, continuing this year. But um, I know that we, as a community, really spoke a lot about what family violence looked like during COVID-19 and what it means to be experiencing abuse at home when people aren't leaving and you're really stuck inside, um, especially for older adults who we're really at, at a higher risk of more severe cases of COVID-19 and death. There was a, an intersecting group of things, a higher need for shelter and also increased fear of reporting, um, fewer options or avenues for identifying elder abuse, um, and frankly, some stigma around skilled nursing facilities and very real infection control procedures um, that that acted kind of as barriers to people accessing the, 
safe place that, that is available to them. Um, but in 2020, almost all of our shelter programs continued to run and accept referrals. Uh, we had over 300 referrals across the country and 71 older adults were admitted into shelter during that time. Um, and I know at least at the Weinberg Center, we had folks that were in shelter with us before the pandemic that stayed on in shelter throughout much of the pandemic, understanding that this was the place that felt most safe and supportive um, for them because the, the access to services in the community looked really so different. Um, okay, and I think we can go to the next slide and I'll hand it back to Joy to talk through this model one. Great, so I, I wanted to just also be um, clear that um, each one of the shelters that programs that is in the Spring Alliance is its own program. So the, as Tristan described it, um, you know, so clearly we have this coalition of people where we um, share uh, materials, we have a monthly call and an annual symposium, but each one of those operates um, independently, is responsible um, independently um, for uh, for the shelter, for fundraising, for all the things that happen with their, within their own shelter program. The Spring Alliance is the coalition where we help support uh, the creation of new shelters and existing shelters. And I'm going to talk now um, about Model 1, um, the shelter program affiliated within a single long-term care facility. So you can turn to the next slide. Great. Um, so we are located in the Bronx um, in Riverdale, and um, we are located within the confines of the Heber home at Riverdale. We are, um, well, when we opened, we were a 32 acre campus, I believe. Um, now we've expanded, uh, the Heber home itself has expanded now to be close to 40 acres, 50 acres. Um, and the Weinberg Center for Elder Justice is a program of the Heber Home in Riverdale. We're, we're located at the Heber Home. Um, I started the program back in 2005 with the CEO of the Heber Home at Riverdale, um, really um, as a response to a significant gap in service. As a prosecutor back in the 80s and 90s, um, there were really no shelters available for, for um, victims who were coming through traditional domestic violence shelters really couldn't support them. Um, so there really weren't a lot of options. And so when I left the DA's office and went to a civil legal service agency, the Pace Women's Justice Center in White Plains, New York, I saw similar things that the few people that came who were older, who needed shelter, uh, there really were no options available to them. So the idea to create shelter um, within a skilled nursing facility just really worked because we could provide so many things within skilled nursing uh, that were not available um, to, to these older women, men, and others. Next slide, please. So the Weinberg Center is integrated into the campus of the Heber Home. Um, at the time, we um, we're a 600-bed long-term care facility, as, as many are. Um, we are contracting the number of beds that we have, really, um, as we change some of our models of care. Um, and we are on 32 acres um, on the Hudson River. Uh, we are a flexible, low-cost model, so we didn't have to build anything. Um, really, it was about um, bringing on a team who could uh, provide the extensive services that our clients need. And the five main pillars of our work, and I, I think um, th this will make sense to all of you, is fundamentally the shelter, the ability to provide um, safe shelter and food, um, and then all the other services, which I'll talk about, um, replication, which is the Spring Alliance. So uh, we started the Spring Alliance, I think back in 2013, as a way to really help others create shelter and hoping that um, some of that will uh, really resonate with you today. Um, we uh, 
do a lot of work um, in the civil legal system um, to uh, advocate for our clients um, in court, whether it's in family court, surrogates court, um, to support uh, DAs in criminal court, um, guardianship. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work there. Tristan, um, really um, a, a leader in, in affecting some legal changes for clients who experience abuse. Uh, we do extensive outreach and training, um, similar to what we're doing today, sometimes really about elder abuse itself. And then finally, we view partnerships like our partnership with APS as critical um, to the work that we're doing. Uh, next slide, please. So the way the Weinberg Center works is we will get a referral from the community and um, thinking back to that slide um, with the circle with all of those referral agencies, the referral will usually come in um, from one of those. Uh, it um, the, comes into an 800 number and then it's uh, referred to the Weinberg team the team, which consists of uh, lawyers and social workers and a public health professional. Wow, that looked fun. <laughs> um, uh, do a lot of work around um, determining who is appropriate for admission. And similarly to um, the standards that you have at APS about who can be an APS client, who's appropriate, we are also really looking at who is appropriate for admission, um, and then to find um, a place for them within the, uh, the larger uh, nursing home. So our clients um, come in and are placed where uh, they're suited medically. So if you came for a visit to uh, the Weinberg Center, we would take you on a tour of the whole campus um, because the nursing home is structured in a way to support medical care. So um, our clients are everywhere throughout the facility. Um, when clients do come in, um, the Weinberg team, as well as a care team in the nursing home pro uh, provide services to them. We do a trauma-informed evaluation. Um, you know, of course, asking uh, our clients what it is that they want and really um, looking to help them reach their goals, including um, they want to return home or maybe not. Um, we provide uh, direct legal services I described and social service, therapeutic service, clinical uh, service for our clients. And our goal really is to discharge them to a safe living environment, whether that's getting their home safe, like you saw we did with Carmen, um, whether it's finding a different housing um, because maybe that house doesn't belong to them anymore or never did. Or sometimes the discharge may be to um, stay with us in long-term care if that's what the client wants or that's what's most appropriate. So this is how our model works generally. Um, next slide, please. Um, our criteria for admission is um, that the older adult must be 60 years or older. Um, we have had a few exceptions um, where a person's chronological age was maybe 57 or 8, but their medical age was probably closer to 70 or 80, so they really need the services of skilled nursing. But mostly our clients are 60 plus, and we've certainly seen uh, clients come in over, you know, certainly into the hundreds, as I'm sure many of you have seen as well. Um, a per the person must be experiencing one or more forms of abuse or is at serious risk of abuse. Uh, the referrals that we take must come from a professional. So if, for example, a neighbor um, is making a referral, um, what we would do is have them perhaps reach out to Adult Protective Service or the police um, because before we, we would take someone in, we need to make sure and really corroborate that um, what is being told to us by the neighbor or family member is actually true. Um, the person um, must be in need of shelter and agrees to be placed in the facility and to come with us and be part of our program. Um, obviously, if the person lacks capacity, um, we either have them come um, because the guardian uh, has agreed to that or the court has agreed. 
um, and the person must agree to have no contact with uh, the people who are causing harm. Um, it's a two week, uh, no visitation policy, and then it's really at the discretion of the team um, who are working with the client to determine that. Next slide, please. So just a kind of a glimpse of what um, the numbers that we're talking about. And again, um, we serve all five boroughs of New York City, as well as Westchester County. So our catchment area in terms of the potential is quite large. Um, but really, when you think about it, for us, the number of older people who are experiencing abuse, um, for whom home isn't safe, who are willing to leave the home, and then willing to come into our program, it really, really whittles down. Um, so you'll see in 2017, I think that was the largest, uh, the biggest number of clients that we ever took in. Um, but you'll see, um, you know, the average really is probably about 17 or 18. And um, this year already, we've had seven clients in, which is actually um, quite amazing that during the pandemic, um, in 2020, 2021, we've, uh, we have 24 people that have come into shelter. Next slide, please. Um, so since we started, we've provided over 180,000 days of shelter. And, you know, what's really important um, to, to talk about with this is that those, um, that's 182,000 days where people without the Weinberg Center or other shelter programs, um, you know, it's really hard to say um, where they would have gone or what would have happened and to really think about the multiple uses of services that would have happened um, had we not been here to provide those days of shelter. And um, so we're really, you know, proud of this. And, and but it's also something that tells us as your polls did, uh, the critical importance of having shelter available for older people. Next slide. Um, this is really um, to articulate uh, in 2020, 12% um, of our referrals came from Adult Protective Service. Um, and it turns out that when we break that number down, that was four clients that came directly from APS. Um, Two, it was determined were not appropriate, um, and two of those clients ultimately decided not to come to shelter. Um, but it was, you know, 10% of our referrals came directly from APS. And if you click the next slide, what's really important is to understand that regardless of the referral source, of the direct from APS, the majority of our clients um, are APS involved at shelter admission. So really important, um, and it's why, again, we, we hold a relationship with APS um, in such high regard, and it's so important to us, is, is that almost all of our clients um, are APS involved in some way, even if APS is not making the referral itself. Next slide. Oh, this is Tristan again, so I'll jump in to talk about a a couple different ways that shelters have sort of formed and, and continue to look like in different places across the country. Um, so the Weinberg Center, which is where we work, so we particularly love that one and know a lot about it, um, operates as that first type of model. We're a, sh we're a shelter program within a long-term care facility. It's fairly straightforward. Another more common type of model is that there's a shelter program that operates externally from any specific physical shelter. And instead, we'll have um, agreements, memorandums of understanding with a few different places that, that are appropriate for folks coming through their quote unquote shelter program. Um, so a great example of a program like this is Sonoma County, California. And this program, you can go to the next slide, this program was initiated by actually the county APS program. Since then, it's transitioned operation to a local social services uh, nonprofit, but still every person referred to that shelter program is an APS client. 
um, once referred to the shelter program, they oh, and they also actually have to have an open criminal case involving that abuse. So it could be at just the investigation stages. It might be that there's a trial ongoing, or maybe that someone's um, been released on bail. There has to be some sort of criminal case involved. So this is really a very specific group of people. Only a portion of the clients that are referred to this program actually have a shelter need, but for those groups, um, the shelter program has a network of different places that folks can go for, for shelter. So that might be a hotel if there's not a lot of medical needs, if they can if all their needs can be appropriately met at a hotel, or they have an agreement with temporary low income senior housing options. Um, so this is just another way that people have figured out um, how to address those emergent shelter needs that uh, clients have. So it, maybe there's not one very specific place that people go. They serve a sort of more specific group of people, must be APS clients, must have an open criminal case, but have uh, agreements with different places that can provide different types of services while meeting that shelter need and the case management wraparound services that um, that nonprofit social service agency is able to provide. If you go to the next slide, um, another model, this is sort of our catch-all model three, other combinations. Um, a great example is in El Paso County, Colorado. Um, next slide, please. This model initially came out of a sort of naturally occurring multidisciplinary team that was, in, that was started by the um, local police department. Um, and this group had been meeting for like at least the last decade, um, had tried to start a shelter type program in the past unsuccessfully. There wasn't really the um, community buy-in or the resources initially. And then in 2016, they really put their resources together, tried again. So for them, all clients referred are APS involved by the time they go into shelter. Although interestingly, not all of the referred people are APS clients at the time of referral, but are referred to APS before they can access shelter. So APS ended up um, providing this really pivotal component of the way that they're able to run their shelter program, which is helping folks have access to Medicaid and other benefits um, that they're eligible for that they might not be receiving for whatever reason. They have memorandums of understanding with 11 skilled nursing facilities um, and one more traditional shelter for folks who don't have the medical needs that necessitate a skilled nursing facility environment. Um, and they're actually in the midst of putting together a, a standalone nonprofit that will be operating this program. Um, right now, it's being operated by a staff person at, um, I think, one of the skilled nursing facilities that's helping to coordinate these placements across really a huge number of um, a huge number of facilities. So you can see that these programs are developing as the community sort of needs them and using all of the really creative solutions that folks I think that do this work always do. Um, but it really depends on what pre-existing relationships you have and, and who's willing to really hold the torch and make sure that the program can keep moving forward. And I know Joy will be uh, speaking a little bit more about, about that. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide. Um, so Joy will talk through what starting a shelter program looks like and figuring out what those community needs and resources are. But to inform that conversation, um, I think Andy is going to initiate another poll for us. Um, so do you have an active relationship with a skilled nursing facility in your community? Thanks, Tristan. I've launched that. And again, just like the other polls, you vote by clicking directly on your screen. <laughs> Um, do you have a strong relationship, some relationship, or really no relationship with uh, skilled facilities in your community? We'll leave this open for a little bit to give everybody a chance to respond. 
I think we'll leave it open for another 15 seconds or so. And if you're in full screen mode, again, just hit escape on your keyboard. Should allow you to vote if you're having problems with it. All right, I'm going to close that out in just a couple seconds, closing it out now, and I'll share the results with everybody. It looks like 15% said a strong relationship, 60% said some relationship, and a quarter of folks at 25% said no relationship. Okay, great. So thanks for um, answering that. And I, um, I'm pleased to see that there was some relationship um, because uh, I think it's, a, it's an opportunity um, to, to be maximizing um, what skilled nursing facilities can do and what they're open to do um, with, uh, to meet some of the needs of adult protective services that we've seen from this conversation. So next slide, please. Um, so I want to talk about uh, starting a program in your community. And what I, I want to say um, to begin that conversation is that uh, Tristan and I are, um, and, the, and the whole Weinberg team, really available to you um, should you have questions um, about this after um, after this webinar that part of the work that we do in the Spring Alliance is really um, to help um, communities figure out, okay, I need this, I want this, maybe now we have some money or maybe we don't, um, what does it even look like, where do we begin? And the beginning, I think, is really having, um, I, I guess the second bullet, maybe identifying the stakeholders um and really understanding who does this matter to and who who would have some skin in the game um that APS um initiated shelter program in Sonoma County that Tristan talked about earlier um I I went out there um they got a federal grant to try to create a program so I spent the day um, the morning with APS uh, professionals, and then the afternoon I spent um, with community stakeholders where um, it was really about what APS needed and then the community people uh, talking about what they needed and, and everybody kind of having to stand up and say, I'm willing to do this. Um, and so that's part of it. What are people willing to do? What can they do? And, and what are the resources and communities that can be used? Um, internal and external conversations are um, conversations that may happen um, within your organization or um, with your community partners. For, for us, um, and in the, in the first model where it's coming out of skilled nursing, it's figuring out what it would look like to have a shelter program within a nursing home, and then really who the external partners are. So again, it's really looking at your community and understanding the landscape of who's there, um, who has what, who can do what, um, and who's gonna be, as, as, as Tristan said, holding the torch um, and, and really walking through with it. Um, every community is different. Um, when we show you the video of Carmen or a picture of our campus, um, that's really to talk about what our program is and, and what our community, the resources we have. Um, and, and there's a lot of things that we've been able to do and build over 17 years, but every community has different needs, um, different resources, um, different you know, numbers of people who may need the service. So part of this conversation is really understanding what does your community need and, and maybe starting to really pay attention to how many people over the course of a year um, that your APS comes in contact with um, might need shelter. And I, I think you may be surprised what that number is. Um, and I'm sure you know that when somebody needs shelter, um, it's vital. Um, and the last piece of understanding the landscape, landscape is that um, continuum of care communities, so places where there are skilled nursing, assisted living, independent living, um, any place that's specifically designed for older people 
um, should really be viewed not as separate from community, but really as part of community. Um, I, I, I think we can probably all agree that um, a whole village includes um, young and old people and diverse people um, and people with various, various needs and abilities. Um, and so community, continuum of care communities really are vital parts of the conversation regarding shelter. And, and part of what we like to do, um, because we are part of a skilled nursing facility, is help APS reach out to or identify um, continuum, of care, continuum of care communities in their community and help create um, relationships as we are part of several associations and coalitions with um, continuum of care communities across the country. So it's something that we like to do and, and are happy to do in terms of introduction, if that's something you might need. Uh, next slide, please. So what, what do we need? What do you need um, for a shelter? Um, and, and we really, you know, over the years, been able to break it down into this, um, these elements. Um, one, you need a champion, and, and I love the expression, who's going to carry the torch. It's the person who says, um, this really matters to my organization, um, and we are going to, um, to take this on. We're going to be responsible for bringing the pieces together, um, and um, whatever needs uh, we have to do that, um, we're going to see that they get met um, through all different sources of funding and other things. Um, obviously, you need appropriate housing. I know, um, you know, in Andy's um, presentation earlier, you know, you really need to know the needs of the client that you're working with. And having skilled nursing available for many of our older adult clients um, has been critical um, for many of the people that have come through in these 17 years. So appropriate housing where they're going to get um, the kind of medical and other care that they need is critical. Um, a network of support services, you know, we, um, none of us do this work alone. None of us could do the work alone. And so it's really important. It's, it's you know, part of what's necessary is to have a community network where um, each person, each organization, each service understands what their goals are. Um, and we're not trying to um, do the work of others, but we're trying to help each other um, in a network of support. Um, you know, it, it's really amazing how many people uh, still are just learning or becoming aware and awake to um, issues of elder abuse. And so part of our work is definitely to raise consciousness and provide training so people understand um, not just about elder abuse, really about the issues of aging um, and um, empowered aging. So we see that as necessary. And obviously, reliable funding, um, you know, that could be number one. Um, you know, it is critical that we are able to um, find funding to pay for shelter days. Um, this has been, you know, a big lift for these many years. Um, we're doing all kinds of things to try to um, make funding more secure including um, looking into Medicaid and Medicare dollars. Um, hopefully some of the money that's come down from the federal government um, to APS will be used um, to support shelter and shelter days um, as it's really coming clear that not being able to provide shelter, not being able to provide these services um, means that all of these other services are being used over and over and over again. And it's, it turns out it's much more expensive um, when there's no appropriate intervention. Next slide. Um, so to that point, um, the RAND Corporation did an independent evaluation of the Weinberg Center model um, last year. And um, a follow-up study with the National Institute of Justice is forthcoming at the end of 2021, probably more likely mid-year 2022. Um, but one of the most important um, findings in this initial evaluation 
is that the shelter is a, a cost-effective model and has the potential to generate extensive savings um, in our cities and communities because by having them sheltered, by having lawyers, by having appropriate intervention, um, trauma-informed services, um, that these clients are not um, continuing to rotate through APS, through MDTs, through emergency rooms, um, through law enforcement, but that there's a real intervention that's happening um, through the shelter model. So, you know, you can imagine it was um, great news for us, what we found in this initial evaluation, and we're looking forward to uh, the next step where we are collecting more data, I think, to deepen um, that evaluation and um, work. So um, we'll keep everybody posted about that follow-up study. Next slide, please. Uh, finally, this is, um, you know, over the 17 years that we've been working, we've done a lot of work to really promote shelter. Um, so this is a list of um, some of the literature that we've put out, um, really all accessible um, on our website, um, and um, particularly the, the monograph on the left, which is accessible on our website, um, has a lot of what we've talked about today. Um, but again, we're really happy to um, help um, you kind of in a more personal way to think about your community and to help you assess what your needs are and how you might get started and happy to help, um, help you get started and invite all of you to um, be part of the Spring Alliance. We have calls the second Thursday of every month. You think I know after 10 years, but it's I think second or third Thursday of every month. Um, but you're more than welcome to join. It's um, often a, a pretty meaty conversation um, and you're certainly welcome to join. Maybe Tristan, if you just want to talk for a minute about the resource guide, I know you were, uh, that's in, you were instrumental in that. So maybe just talk about that for a minute. Yes, always happy to plug the Elder Justice Resource Guide. <laughs> Um, we, the Weinberg Center worked closely with the New York court system to put together, I think, a really comprehensive guide um, about what, it, what access to justice for older adults really looks like. So it covers in the first half um, accessible courtrooms, uh, trying to distinguish capacity and confusion, ways to communicate, um, and really how to just better interface, how to develop a better interface for older adults we're trying to access justice through the court system. Um, if you happen to be calling in from New York, there's also a huge guide of um, resources in each judicial district, uh, specifically for older adults who might be experiencing abuse. Um, but it's a really, the first half is a great resource for anyone who works with older adults, especially anyone who works with older adults who are interested in accessing uh, the justice system. So all this is available on our website, and it's uh, the, Weinberg, the Weinberg Center org, and easy to access. Um, you can um, do the next slide, please. And this is just a picture of the team, so you can see who we are, and um, certainly contact information for all of us. So I, I think we have um, a decent amount of time if anybody has any questions um, about the Weinberg Center, Shelter, um, our work with APS, um, anything at all, we're happy to, um, to answer. Well, thank you, Joy and Tristan. That was great information. Um, and it sounds like starting an elder shelter, you know, meets the, the needs of clients with all kinds of of backgrounds from with different needs, whether that is, you know, minor medical needs all the way up to um, somebody who needs skilled care. So um, yeah, thank that's you. definitely one of the, mm -hmm. you know, I think one of the motivations for having shelter here was so many clients could not access um, traditional domestic violence shelters or other, um, you know, housing options because of medical and other uh you know cognitive needs so the having it, it within skilled nursing you know th there's no limit yep. um on that. yep 
Um, all right, if we can go to the next slide, which I believe is just our questions slide. Um, this is the time to ask your questions about today's presentation, whether it's regarding my content or the content that Joy and Tristan um, spoke of. We have a couple, one comment and one question so far. Um, this one comment came in when you were showing the video earlier, and um, it says, amazing story of Carmen, sincere congratulations on your efforts. So I thought that was a very nice note to hear. Somebody found that video very inspirational. Um, the other question that we have right now is, it appears that an elder shelter would be very costly because of the wraparound services that would be needed to care for that person. Again, it appears that an elder shelter would be very costly because of the wraparound services that would be needed to care for that person. Do you guys want to take a stab at that? Yeah, sure. So um, the way in which many of the models um, are dealing with costs um, for us in New York, and I know it's different in every state, uh, but um, a lot of the states that you saw on that Spring Alliance list, you know, have figured this out. We in New York, um, most of our clients are Medicaid eligible. Um, I mean, it's maybe it's kind of stands to reason that a person who has no other alternative, no other place to go, no resources or access to resource, um, most often those people um, are Medicaid eligible. So we have probably an 85 to 90 percent of our clients um, been able to apply for Medicaid for our clients. So a lot of the costs are covered by that. Um, and the RAND study really demonstrated um, that I think as we've known that that is um, because they're Medicaid eligible and getting services that are uh, medical services that are appropriate, um, it, it still is cost effective um, to do it that way. Um, in terms of, you know, for us, our, the salaries of our staff, um, we have applied um, and have been generous recipients of foundation grants, um, uh, state grants, um, city council grants. So, you know, that champion, that torchbearer, um, part of the work is trying to figure out um, how do I fund um, the staff that can provide some of these services? In some of the places, like in Buffalo, New York, um, the, the, um, the champion is a civil legal service agency. So they are already funded to, uh, with their lawyers and the um, skilled nursing facilities that they use and have MOUs with have um, social service staff um, and care managers who are doing the work um, already paid for, you know, within the work of those skilled nursing facilities. So mm -hmm. some of this is really organizational and thinking through how can we figure out um, some of those financial questions. Sure. Um, from my standpoint, the content I um, presented on in the early part, uh, you know, the wraparound services aren't necessarily extensive with anyone. I did talk about transportation a little bit. If you're going to transport someone to and from a facility, that might be the only real extra service that you need to worry about. Um, but, you know, when you if you don't have a shelter in your community and you are going to work with certain facilities and I actually would encourage you to look into starting an elder shelter, elder shelter before, um, you know, going it alone, so to speak then you, know, you want to get an idea from your potential providers what the costs are and, and do an analysis of, of how much it's going to be. But it doesn't always mean that the wraparound services are very expensive. Sometimes it's you know, just the stay. And it often depends on the level of care for the person. So, um, One other question that came in, are you aware of any standalone elder, elder shelters? Um, there is one in Canada that I am aware of. I'm not aware of any in in the U.S. And I think, um, and if anybody knows anything different, I, we would love to know. I, I think part of that is because the staffing of a standalone shelter with for older people is really complex because the ages, the medical needs, 
um, kind of who needs to be there, security is very, is shifting and changing all the time. Right. So it's really hard to know how to staff um, something like that or what the beds look like. And so it, it, it gets very complicated. And, and that's, I think, where the costs get um, pretty prohibitive. Yep. Um, so I don't, I'm not aware, but if anybody is, please let us know. Well, it looks like that's all the questions that we have from the audience. Um, if anyone has any questions, you are welcome to type them in right now. Um, I think we'll go to the last slide, which just has the contact information for the EPS TARC. If you haven't seen our website, I would recommend that you go there. We have lots of information for APS programs. And here's our email address if you want to reach out to us and ask for assistance with any of your formula grant funding or any other type of issue that you are struggling with. So that's why we're here is to help with, um, with anything you might be struggling with. We'll take this uh, recording from today and put it online along with the slides and give everyone um, an email, send everyone an email when uh, you're able to access that. Uh, online. And I just wanted to say thanks to Joy and Tristan for joining us today and giving us all this great information. It is greatly appreciated. I learned a lot myself. So thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Well, everyone have a great afternoon. Thanks for attending today. Take care. <laughs>